If I were to describe how the average Catholic looks at the world today, I'd describe it like this. Broad and wide is the way that leads to heaven, and everybody's going that way. And narrow is the door that leads to hell, and hardly anybody's going that way. But you know what? That's just the opposite of what Jesus himself tells us the situation is. Broad and wide is the way that leads to destruction, and many are traveling that way. And narrow is the door that leads to life, and few there are who are finding it. Now, Jesus didn't say this because this is how it has to be. People who are on the Broadway don't have to stay on the Broadway, and that's where we come in. That's where our prayer, that's where our love, that's where our intercession, that's where our witness comes in. We need to really invite people to leave the path that's leading to destruction and find the person of Jesus Christ who can lead them to true life here on this earth and eternal life. Hey, welcome to another week of The Choices We Face. It's really inspiring how each week we can just share with you some of the wonderful things the Lord is doing in the church and some of the wonderful insights into God's Word that, that He's giving us. And this week we have a visitor with us called Brandon Vaught. Brandon is a husband and a father of four children, and he's a mechanical engineer, and he lives in Orlando, Florida, and he's emerged as one of the experts on the church and new media. Brandon, welcome. Thank you, Ralph. Good to be here. Good to have you. Tell us a little bit about your story, you know, how you became an active Catholic and all that. Well, I was born and raised in a Presbyterian church, and uh, for the first 18 years of my life, we went to church every Sunday, but it was kind of more of a nominal faith. I'd never really met Jesus in a personal way. Uh, but then I got to college and went to Florida State University, and I fell in with a Methodist campus ministry. And it was there that I had a real encounter with the Lord. Uh, I started reading the Bible for the first time on my own. Uh, I started praying. I fell into a group of guys who would meet every week and study the Bible. And uh, I really decided at that point to give my life over to the Lord. Uh, but then my senior year, through a wide variety of circumstances, I ended up exploring the Catholic Church, uh, going through RCIA. And then about two weeks before I graduated, I entered the Catholic Church on Easter of 2008. And so since then, uh, the Lord's just been <laughs> taking me on a wild journey of, of uh, writing and speaking and uh, discovering all the riches of this Catholic tradition that uh, I've fallen in love with over the last five years. Okay, well, let, let's fill in that picture just a little bit more. Like, like how, did, how did the first commitment to Christ actually really happen? What was it that, that led you to surrender your life to Christ you know, when you were running into the Methodist? It was actually a mix of uh, intellectual and emotional uh, reasons. Uh, perhaps one of the biggest ones was I had been doing quite a bit of reading about the resurrection. I became enchanted by what I consider to be the hinge of Christianity, as St. Paul would, would call it. And I hit that point, many people do, where they say, if Jesus is really risen from the dead, then he's God, and I got to give my whole life to him. If he's not, forget it, you know, I'm out of here. And so I read a lot of books on the historical uh, uh, reliability, the historical truth of the resurrection, and became convinced that Jesus really did rise from the dead, and he's alive today, and I can interact with him. And once I realized that, then that's when I decided to give my whole life to him. That was the beginning of a uh, personal relationship that continues and, and continues to grow and thrive. That makes a lot of sense, doesn't it? If it he does. really is who he says he is. We found it, you know. That's right. Found a pearl of great price. It. Yeah, really. Now, what would be some of the resources? I don't know if you could remember right off the top of your head uh, about the reliability of the historical resurrection of Christ. Well, I read many popular level books. One of the first ones was Lee Strobel's Case for Christ. And he went around the country interviewing the historical experts, the scientific and philosophical experts. And so that provided a groundwork, but it was more of a, you know, a very popular level book, not really intensely researched. Um, so then I read some more, uh, some, some deeper resources. Uh, William Lane Craig is an evangelical philosopher who I, uh, is one of the experts on the historicity of Jesus. And so reading these, I became convinced um, on the one hand, that it was likely Jesus had risen from the dead. I believe that by faith, but I also became convinced equally well that all of the alternatives people have proposed are totally implausible. Mm -hmm. That Jesus's body was stolen, that his appearances were hallucinations. Um, th all of these seem to be ad hoc, arbitrary explanations. None of them had the persuasiveness of what the church has maintained for 2,000 years, that 
Jesus resurrected and is alive today. Yeah, that's really great. Now, uh, tell us a little bit more about the journey to the Catholic Church. Good. So uh, my senior year, uh, my now wife and I were thinking about marriage. We had been dating since high school for about four years, and she was born and raised Catholic. And so we started thinking for the first time, what are we going to do when we get married? Are we going to go to two different churches? I was Protestant. She was Catholic. Where are we going to raise our kids? And it was at that point that I realized I had never really given Catholicism serious consideration. She was basically the only Catholic I knew. Was she actually a practicing Catholic? or She was. Yeah. She went through her own uh, spiritual transformation at the Catholic Student Union at Florida State, simultaneous to my own uh, deeper conversion to the Lord. And so for the first time, I started reading Catholic books. I started, uh, I interacted with a religious brother at Florida State, Brother Jason. Who's, who's that from the Brothers of Brotherhood of Hope? Yes, yeah, that's right. Yeah. Um, their charism is campus ministry, and so they're on many campuses up and down the East Coast. And Brother Jason, as uh, Providence would have it, uh, not only had previously gone to Florida State, uh, he majored in physics, which was my major at the time. So he had this mathematical, analytical way of looking at faith and the world. And he entered Florida State as a Methodist and converted to Catholicism his last year. Well, what, so, what do you think about I that? Know. Yeah, really. That's I, and it was something yeah. I could not have chalked up to chance. It was pure providence that God would put him in my path to walk with me during this process. Mm -hmm. And so we met every week. We talked often. I read lots of books. I prayed extensively. And um, the, if the hinge of my conversion to Christ was the resurrection, uh, the hinge of my conversion to Catholicism was the Eucharist. Uh, I asked a similar question about the Eucharist that I did to the resurrection, that um, is this true? And if it is, I got to become Catholic. If this is the Lord I love here every day in every Catholic church, how could I stay away? If it's not true, it's the greatest idolatry the church has ever seen, and I need to get as far away from it as I can. And so I, I read extensively through the church fathers, through the church's theological tradition, and examined the biblical evidence from a Catholic perspective, and again became persuaded that um, when the priest says the words of uh, consecration that Jesus becomes present in the Eucharist. And so from there, everything else fell into place like dominoes and I decided to become Catholic. Yeah, well, that's, that's really great. And uh, since then, you've become quite a, a witness to the faith, haven't you? Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you to the Lord. Uh, but since I became Catholic, I um, have been writing and speaking and uh, all of it has seemed to kind of snowball almost unexpectedly. And uh, I keep trying to follow where the Lord takes me, even if it's in surprising and unexpected directions. I know one of the things that's happened is that you've become sort of very involved in new media and a big advocate of the importance of evangelization through new media, or your book, The Church and New Media. Now, tell us a little bit about uh, how you got into that, what, what actually you're doing there with new media, how you're evangelizing through, through these new media. So when I was in college, Facebook launched. And when it came out, it was originally open only to college students. And so I was one of the very first people to use this tool, which now over a billion people have accounts on. And I was using Twitter and blogs and a lot of these social media tools in the early years. Just for the sake of our audience, explain a little bit what Facebook is. People have heard about it, but people may not be on it. They may be the other five billion people that, <laughs> yeah. are, that aren't on Facebook, right. you know, or what, what Twitter is and, you know, all that. Yeah. So all of these tools are what are known as social media. And so these are essential, essentially digital technologies uh, built around the Internet that bring people together for conversation, to share articles, pictures, videos, and whatnot. Facebook is the largest social network in the world, and in fact, the world's most popular website. Like I said, it has over a billion users, half of whom log in every single day. I'm one of them. <laughs> and people go to Facebook every day to share uh, interesting news and pictures of their kids, uh, funny videos of cats, and all sorts of weird things like that. Uh, YouTube is a video site where people can exchange videos. Uh, Twitter is a website where people exchange messages of 140 characters or less. So this means that all the letters, spaces, and symbols have to add up to less than 140, and they're called tweets. Um, and so all of these tools have taken the world by storm. And so what I recognized fairly early on was that the secular world is using these tools tremendously to spread its message. Protestants, many of my brothers and sisters and friends, 
are using these tools to spread their message quite effectively. The Catholic Church, though, is kind of behind the times. And so what I realized quickly after my conversion was that we really needed to get the church up to speed with these tools. And so that's where the book emerged. I gathered some of the experts in the fields of blogging and YouTube and tweeting and put them together to create this handbook for the digital world. You know, I, I was I was amazed, you know, you and I were both at the Defending the Faith Conference at, at Franciscan University and Mark Hart was there. Well, Mark is, is a big leader in Life Teen, this outreach to uh, Catholic youth that's being used all across the country. And he's written a book composed of tweets. So, so there's these like, many, many like 144 character tweets. And I started reading it and it's almost like it's a new literary form. I mean, I mean it's, like, it's like a Japanese haiku or something like that. And some of them were so creative, you know, it's just so amazing. So I, I showed it to my daughter who teaches at Catholic Central High School in uh, Steubenville. And she says she's gonna post one of those tweets every single day on the whiteboard or blackboard or whatever they're using these days in classrooms because they're just really, uh, really punchy little ways of, of sending a message sometimes with humor and but but just quite creative i yeah i agree that's a great book mark's uh, tweet inspiration is the name that's of the what book it's called, tweet and, inspiration. Uh, pe people always say to me especially institutional church leaders uh, how can we communicate the church's timeless deep message in such a short pithy form uh, i always point them to our lord and the beatitudes and when you examine them Every single one of the Beatitudes is less than 140 characters. And so there, wow. you, there you have Jesus, <laughs> yeah. the original tweeter. <laughs> <laughs> That's really amazing. Now, I know that you started a, a, a new website called Strange Notions. Now, that's really a strange notion, Brandon. <laughs> Tell us about Strange Notions. So Strange Notions gets its name from the 17th chapter of Acts. This is where St. Paul goes up to the Areopagus, also known as Mars Hill. And it was the first time a Christian had evangelized uh, pagan philosophers. So he goes up to this hill um, where all the greatest thinkers and minds sit around and, as the Bible tells us, discuss new things. You know, it sounds a lot like the Internet, <laughs> people sitting around all day discussing new things. And he proclaims Jesus risen from the dead, this great uh, uh, charismatic message. But as his listeners sit and listen, they say, you bring some strange notions to our ears. We're not sure what these things mean, but can you come back tomorrow and tell us more? And so the idea for this website was to, again, proclaim the great gospel of Christ, uh, again, to a pagan world and to a sophisticated intellectual world with the hope that many people will see the Catholic message for the first time and say, these are some strange notions, but we would like to hear more. And so the site puts Catholics and atheists in particular in dialogue about some of the biggest questions of life. That's really great. Well, we actually have a little a short little video that kind of introduces people to strange notions. So let's take a look at it and then we'll come back and continue to talk.
Hey, Brandon, that was a pretty creative spot. You know, it makes you want to kind of go to Strange Notions. It's I hope so. StrangeNotions.com. That's right. Yeah. Now, do you actually have atheists coming on the site and engaging in conversation and dialogue? We do. That's been the most surprising thing I've seen so far. In the, in the first few months, we had over 500,000 page views and over 30,000 comments. And I expected that we'd get a large number of Catholics who would be coming on and reading and commenting, and then we'd struggle to engage atheists. But just the opposite has been true. Uh, of the first 30,000 comments, about 70% of them were from atheists. Wonderful. And these are serious-minded, charitable atheists, not interested in scoring rhetorical points, but in really getting to the truth of these big questions. Yeah, now who actually do they interact with? Like, do, do, or, or do you have to interact with all these people yourself? Or do you have other people helping you? Or do you just have stuff posted there that they can access? Or? So we uh, post a new article every single weekday, so five times a week. And that's sort of the launching point that establishes the conversation topic. And then the real action happens in the comment boxes. So anybody can come and either add, ask a question, point out an objection, uh, make, add their two cents. And so I'm in there almost every day in the comment boxes, but we also have five other moderators of the comment boxes to make sure the conversation stays on par. And then we have, of course, uh, hundreds of other Catholics and atheists who come in, and the conversations there have been remarkable, I think. Yeah, so it isn't just you that's engaging in conversation. Right. It's anybody who would like to. Anybody can Catholic, come in. Catholic, atheists can talk to each other and engage in conversation. You got it. Yeah. What are some of the most common uh, conversations or you know, points of discussion? Well, one of, the, one of the critiques you'll hear from atheists most often is that there is no evidence for God. There is no evidence for God. Now, as Catholics, we believe that there's lots of evidence for God, both personally, subjectively, and objectively. Uh, the First Vatican Council, as I'm sure you know, dogmatically declared that we can know God exists through reason alone, through looking at the world around us and making inferences and deductions. Um, and so what they often mean by saying there's no evidence is there's no empirical evidence for God. You can't see or hear or taste or smell. You can't measure You can't something. touch him. Yeah. yeah. And we Catholics would respond, well, of course, because God is not a physical being within our universe. He's not like a mythical grandfather floating off in some distant sphere, uh, corner of the cosmos. It's not as if we can sail to space and find God. Um, so we wouldn't expect there to be empirical evidence. So those are the sort of roadblocks to faith that we try to carefully clear away. Uh, we, we try to clear up misconceptions and move away resistances people have to faith. Yeah. Do you, do you, I guess what happens in people's minds and hearts and souls is something that you don't have immediate access to, but you know that misconceptions are being taken away, uh, false perceptions are being removed, and the way is like a little bit like John the Baptist, you're like preparing the way for the Lord to, to show himself to people. That's right. You know, in, in this sort of evangelistic work, I always reference Jesus' parable of the sower, where he's throwing out seeds, some lands on shallow ground, some strangled by the thorn, some lands on the path and none of it produces fruit, some lands on good soil and yeah. produces great fruit. Uh, but the key to the parable and the key to evangelizing online or offline is that you really never know where your seed's going to land, but we still got to scatter the seeds yeah. liberally yeah, anyway. Absolutely. And so uh, we haven't seen anybody yet who has said, wow, I came to that site as an atheist. Now I believe in God. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Uh, but we have seen lots of people who have had significant misconceptions about who God is or misunderstandings about church teaching who now understand it better. And so those roadblocks don't exist anymore. So one by one, we can help yeah. people come closer yeah. to the Lord. Yeah, yeah. Well, Brandon, you know, this website is really valuable because I was uh, just recently on an airplane with somebody and they were talking to me about their life, you know, striking up a conversation. And they're telling me how they were raised a Catholic, but now they really were nothing. But recently they've been reading uh, some of the new atheists, you know, and, and he's become like on fire now as an atheist. Or I said, are you really an atheist? He said, well, maybe I'm an agnostic, but I'm on fire. And, and I said, well, what are some of the, your, your problems with, with, with faith in God? You know, what, what, and, and he told me some of them. We were able to resolve some of them, I think. And, but then I, I got home and I emailed you and I said, what can I tell this guy? What, what resources can I show him? And so uh, you gave me some suggestions and I emailed him an e-book. He was going to Manila, you know, in the Philippines. So it got to him in Manila. And then I also told him about your website. And, and, and he wrote back to me saying, hey, really, really glad to get this material. I'm really looking forward to accessing the website. So it was just great to be able to have a 
website that I could refer somebody to that really is specifically designed for answering questions that atheists have. That's right. You know, it, there's not a lot of resources out there to answer what you refer to, the so-called new atheism. So this is a modern resurgence of particularly fiery, arduous atheism, uh, which is has some parallels. I, I say, uh, I tell people that p men like Richard Dawkins, Christopher Hitchens, Sam Harris, and Daniel Dennett are like the Peter and Paul of the modern world. They're making converts all across the world with great fire and zeal. Um, and so we Catholics need to be prepared to answer with that same fire and, and the same reasons for our faith. And you can't always tell people, hey, just go read the Summa Theologia, part one, question two, yeah. article three, you know, yeah, yeah. Um, does God exist? And so we need a more popular level, easy to access uh, explanation of why Catholics believe what we believe about God. And so that was why we created the website, yeah. Strange Notions. Well, it's really great to have it. Now, you say that you're on Facebook every day and you're on strangenotions.com every day and you're probably on a lot of other things each day. Now, how do you do this as a, as a, as a husband and a father of four children and full-time occupation? Well, I try to manage my time very carefully. I'm, I've long been a believer that the Lord gives each of us a certain amount of time each day and we need to be good stewards of it. And so I try not to waste it in frivolous stuff or watching hours of TV every day. And so I, I try to be very meticulous about squeezing it in. Uh, but you mentioned I work full time as a mechanical engineer and I, I see that as part of my central vocation. In addition to being a father and a husband and evangelist, uh, I think working in the white collar world is a, a calling that most of us have. 98% of Catholics are called to work in the world and to be in the world. And so um, I try not to let my evangelism conflict with my work, but to allow the two to complement each other. Now, how much sleep do you get? <laughs> One hour a night. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I'm kidding. I get seven or eight hours a night. Oh, um, but yeah. I, I'm, I'm also a long believer that uh, if you really have something you're passionate about, something that you, you've been dreaming about, to write a book, to create a project, if the Lord is calling you to something in particular, um, that you need to devote all of your energy to it. And so I always try to be the first one awake in my house. I try to be the last one to go to bed. And so I use those hours when nobody else is awake to work on these evangelistic projects, not stealing away time from family. And, and I, I found that that's what it work, how it works out best. You know, I'm tired, sure, but I'm, I'm doing work that I know the Lord is calling me to and that I feel excited to do. What kind of advice would you give to other lay Catholics about how to keep their life really centered on Christ? Yeah, well, there's the perennial question of the church. <laughs> um, I'd say follow the church's plan that she's proposed for 2,000 years, which is to familiarize yourself with scripture, spend time in deep prayer, frequent the sacraments, mingle with other Christians who can encourage your faith. Um, all of those things are time tested. These, these are the ways to make saints. And if we're all called to be saints, that's the way to do it. Now, how would you, uh, what suggestions would you have for somebody who maybe doesn't feel like they're quite ready to start a blog about how they could share the faith with other people? Yeah, I, I would suggest <clears throat> all you got to do is dip your foot in. Don't feel like you have to master all of these tools. Pick one, try it out and get good at it. Um, the one I recommend to most people before starting a blog is to create a Facebook account. Now just go to facebook.com. It'll take you about five minutes to get up and going. And that is a way to reach far more people than anyone could imagine 100 years ago. You can instantly connect with thousands of people. So that's a great, easy, quick way to begin spreading the faith online. Now what do they do? Do they post pictures of their cats, like you say? Or, or, or <laughs> Some do, do. Or do they say, now I'm going to the grocery store, or now, you know, like, what, how, do, how, do you, how do you evangelize? Well, them? a simple way would be, you know, just got back from Mass. What a powerful, incredible mm. moment. Just went to confession. I feel so liberated. Oh, yeah. Here's a quote from my favorite saint. You know, things like that are small seeds yeah. you can scatter yeah. around the online like, world. Like you share your life on Facebook, but you kind of work in things from your life that would be a witness. Bingo. Yeah. yeah, that's really good. Well, we're going to take a little break now to tell people about something that will help them in evangelizing. This is a booklet that uh, Peter Herbeck has written called What's Our Message? And besides kind of becoming familiar with all the different avenues that are open for us to evangelize today, we really need to be clear on what the content of the message is, what God's plan of salvation really is. And we're going to tell you how you can get this booklet and a little bit more about it. And then we'll come back and we'll ask Brandon to maybe offer some final comments. At the heart of the new evangelization is the proclamation of the gospel, which St. Paul describes as the power of God for salvation. Brothers and sisters, it's the good news about the person of Jesus Christ, our Savior. 
Recent popes have reminded us that all believers, by virtue of their baptism, have been personally commissioned and sent by Jesus to tell others about him. In my new booklet, The New Evangelization, What's Our Message? I outline the essential elements of the gospel in a clear and concise way that makes the message accessible to you and can help you convey it to others. To receive your free copy of What's Our Message, visit our website at renewalministries.net or call 1-800-282-4789. Join us in sharing this good news. God bless you. Well, we're only having another few minutes with our guest, Brandon, but I want to tell you about his book again, The Church and New Media. And he also has a website besides strangenotions.com. He has his own personal website, brandonbot.com, where he has all kinds of resources that also you can access. Uh, Brandon, could you just kind of take the last little time we have here and just speak from your heart to the folks that are with us today, just whatever words that you feel like you should say? Sure. I, I'd, I'd really encourage everybody to follow the same questions that I followed. Ask yourself, do I really believe that Jesus is risen from the dead and alive today? Do I really believe that Jesus is present in the Eucharist, that it's more than just a symbol? Those two questions, I think, are the hinges on which the entire spiritual life turns. And so research those. Make sure that you are firm in what you believe, that you have strong reasons for it. And then I'd also encourage you to be zealous for sharing the faith. Um, I have it always been excited about sharing the good news. I've been nervous and awkward. Uh, but the thing that really helped me was the words of John Paul II, his most favorite phrase, be not afraid. Even amidst awkwardness, even amidst worry, even amidst incompetence, the Lord still speaks through us if we're not afraid to go out to the ends of the earth and evangelize. So know your faith, love the Lord, and do not be afraid. Thanks, Brandon. Those are really good words, good advice, and true words. I'd like to tell you that uh, it's just a privilege being with you every week, and it's a privilege sharing these things about that are most important about the faith. And I'd just like to encourage you to, wherever you are, uh, be inspired by the things that Brandon shared, not just his words, but how he's living his life. And, you know, you too kind of take a concern for the time that you've been given. You know, we, we have been given a, a, a certain number of days and a certain hours in each day. And make sure you're using those hours and using those days in a way that's really giving glory to God and helping other people. And, and, you know, you need your sleep. You can take seven or eight hours of sleep like Brandon does, but also don't forget your prayer time and don't forget to do some study and don't forget to look for ways to be a witness to others. So until next week, this is Ralph Martin wishing you the very best, a life that's really firmly rooted in faith in Jesus Christ and the power of his resurrection, living in the Catholic Church with the food and nourishment of the Eucharist and reaching out to others in love, service, and witness. Mm -hmm.